we saw Nebuchadnezzar in action invading piecemeal the Jewish nation and displaying his nature in his wisdom of trying to um, en enlarge his empire by bringing people into subjection and the kings of nations into subjection to himself and yet giving them the freedom to govern in their own area of dominion, but under him. This was his magnanimous character. He was a very wise and intelligent king, but yet a terrible heathen. And at the conclusion of our study, uh, we, we identified that in the most degraded human being, there are two characteristics. One of the, the cruelty and, and evil of sinfulness, and on the other side, a noble, respectful, kind way. And it was this that we read that Jesus said in Luke chapter 19 that he came to seek and save that which was lost. And we concluded by saying that we will watch this happening, how Jesus sought out a person like Nebuchadnezzar and the good that was in him to seek and save that which was lost. And so this evening we continue to examine King Nebuchadnezzar in the way that he revealed himself in the captivity, in, in, in the invasion of Judah and taking them finally into captivity. We remember that Nebuchadnezzar and his nation was spoken of in the book of Habakkuk. Let's read it again there in a little enlarged uh, format. He, Habakkuk chapter 1 and verses 5 through to 11. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves and their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. And then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend 
imputing this power unto his God. Here is the description of that hasty and um, and cruel nation of which Nebuchadnezzar was the king. And it's interesting, the language here, <coughs> Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously. Here are words by which we should be um, uh, stimulated to realize that what we are studying here is something to wonder at marvelously. For I will work a work in your days which you will not believe though it be told you. <laughs> I like this because the things that we are contemplating here in the research into the depth of God's word of what he was doing through Nebuchadnezzar in the lives of the Jews there, it was a story that it's, is, as it is told us and as we've already expressed among ourselves, uh, you know, we've read the story, but wow, we haven't really seen its depth. And it is something which is marvellous that God is doing. And as we pick up this evening we are looking at a characteristic in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar which is desperately cruel. So our study here is to take a close look at the extremes of contrast in an individual. And yet, what God can do with those extreme contrasts. How would Nebuchadnezzar treat the people whom he had so kindly given the freedom to be vassals of his kingdom, to take care, to give them the freedom to rule in their own country, and yet if they would turn against him after he was so kind to them, what would he do? How would he treat the obstinate Judah? We saw that in our previous study and we want to uh, enlarge that now as we look at Prophets and Kings, page 458, paragraph 3. You will remember Zedekiah was the last king. The weakness of Zedekiah was a sin for which he paid a fearful penalty. The enemy swept down like a resistless avalanche and devastated the city. And we had studied that this morning, how he came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. The Hebrew armies were beaten back in confusion. The nation was conquered. Zedekiah was taken prisoner. Now notice the cruelty. And his sons were slain before his eyes. And when that had been done, the king was led away from Jerusalem captive. His eyes were put out. And after arriving in Babylon, he perished miserably. This was the, the, the cruel captivity that Nebuchadnezzar practiced. Can you imagine the impact upon King Zedekiah? His sons were slain in front of his eyes and then his eyes were poked out. And that's all that he ever saw. What a cruel behavior was in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. The king was led away captive, his eyes were put out, and the beautiful temple that for more than four centuries had crowned the summit of Mount Zion was not spared by the Chaldeans. They burnt the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. 
And on page 459 it continues, At the time of the final overthrow of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, many had escaped the horrors of the long siege, only to perish by the sword. What cruelty, you know, they they were surrounding the city and it was a terrible long siege and the people were in, in desperate fear. And now they had survived that and then they were all slain. Cruel captivity. Of those who still remained, some, notably the chief of the priests and officers and the princes of the realm, were taken to Babylon and there executed as traitors. Others were carried captive to live in servitude to Nebuchadnezzar and to his sons. You know, the people who were left over, they, you know, you can imagine their hopes. Oh, these are all being slain and we are being carried into captivity. We'll live. And then in captivity they were slain. Nebuchadnezzar knew how to how to dangle the the cruelty of experience in his captives. He had this particular trait in him, and um, it's an interesting lesson that we are here to contemplate. Remember, we are here to contemplate the lessons from the life of Nebuchadnezzar. This is our theme. He was a proud being, a proud human nature, cruel and yet wise and forbearing, willing to give government to Judah, remember? So he would have prided himself. You know, I'm a very good person. Look how kind I am. And if these people are going to be rebellious against me, well, I'll give them, I'll give them the works and his cruelty would be aroused. But he was such a kind and good king, he thought. Remember what the story was when Jeremiah was speaking to the, to the representatives of the nations there? He came in with a wooden yoke. And he said, this is Nebuchadnezzar. He'll just keep you under a wooden yoke, not under an iron yoke. But you, you arouse him, and he's got a nature who will be very cruel. And that's what we've been reading about. Let's read here on page 447 of uh, Prophets and Kings. Um, Prophets and Kings, page uh, 447. In paragraph 2. Through Daniel and others of the Hebrew captives, the Babylonian monarch had been made acquainted with the power and supreme authority of the true God. And we will go into the detail of that tomorrow in the divine service. And when Zedekiah once more solemnly promised to remain loyal Nebuchadnezzar required him to swear to this promise in the name of the Lord God of Israel. We remember we had studied that this morning. So you can see the magnanimous mentality of this king. He had recognized the God through God of Israel through Daniel and he realized, yes, God is a wonderful God. He probably already had his dream explained to him. And now he thought, well... Uh, the king of Judah, who Daniel was a subject of, would surely be loyal to his God. And so in his magnanimous heart, he said, okay, you promised that you will remain loyal to me and I'll take care of you. It's going to be fine. But, as we know so well, he rebelled against this, that is Zedekiah, 
And what did Nebuchadnezzar do? This is a very interesting med- uh, exercise here. Nebuchadnezzar required him to swear to, to this promise in the name of the Lord God of Israel. Had Zedekiah respected this renewal of his covenant oath, his loyalty would have had a profound influence on the minds of many who were watching the conduct of those who claimed to reverence the name and to cherish the honor of the God of the Hebrews. Daniel was doing his work in captivity and now Zedekiah was being watched. And can you see the atheistical or the heathen mind that says, wow, God is great. Now, these people who are his people, how are they going to demonstrate his, their loyalty to him? And Zedekiah could have given God the glory. But again, he rebelled. And so the king went, we'll give it to him. Right? This is natural. The natural heart of man is here demonstrated. And it's very interesting. If this kind of courtesy, if this kind of kindness that a natural heart extends towards his enemies, can you understand that if that is spurned, how will it turn? How how do you behave in your natural self? If somebody poohoos your goodness, how do you react? Hmm? What's the natural reaction? Just exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. Let's read it here in Proverbs 17.11. Proverbs 17, verse 11. An evil man seeketh only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. There it was in Proverbs and uh, that was written by Solomon and Zedekiah should have known that. And in his rebellion, in his uh, opposition to the king of that, that he was a vassal for, uh, that, he, that the king had given him mercy, because he was rebellious, a cruel messenger shall be sent against him. And that's precisely what we're looking at. This is the natural human heart. And I'm going to read here a quote from uh, Steps to Christ, page 58, which tells you that you can have a natural heart that loves to do good, but uh, but your natural heart is still cruel, is still not of God. Very uh, powerfully expressed here in Steps to Christ, Page 58, paragraph 1. It says, It is true that there may be an outward correctness of deportment without the renewing power of Christ. The love of influence and the desire for the esteem of others may produce a well-ordered life. Self-respect may lead us to avoid the appearance of evil. A selfish heart may perform generous actions. That's the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. He was generous. He was kind. But don't cross his path. Don't become rebellious and poo-hoo his kindness and he will become cruel. This is the natural heart. And we are looking at the study of this man to discover the way a natural heart behaves. And each one of us with our natural heart must understand that about ourselves. I can actually be a a nominal Christian with my natural heart. I can do things that God wants me to do. The natural heart 
can do honorable things. And as we saw, Nebuchadnezzar was one of those actors in the drama of life that God could use with his natural heart to orchestrate the punishment of Judah. And as you will be studying in the Sabbath school lesson for the next quarter, you will see that repeated all the way through Daniel chapter 11. The the behavior of human beings that God will orchestrate, the good and the bad in the natural heart, and, and unfold the development of the history from the time of Babylon right through to, the, to our time. So this point is brought out powerfully here in uh, um, 2SP. Spirit, what's the SP? Um, 2SP, page 52. The story, not the story of redemption. Um, anyway, I, I can't uh, identify the, the actual... Uh, longer term, but 2SP, page 52, paragraph 4. Here it is. A spirit of prophecy statement which says, We are cited by the apostles to the unbelief, blindness, rebellion and repeated sins of the Hebrews as a warning. Paul plainly states that all these things happened unto them for ensamples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Here it is. This is what this is written for. Upon us, upon whom the ends of the world has come. If in these last days of peril, for the encouragement of persons in responsible positions, God in mercy gives them a testimony of favor, they frequently become lifted up and lose sight of their frailties and weaknesses and rely upon their own judgment, flattering themselves that God cannot accomplish this work without their especial aid. They trust in their own wisdom and the Lord permits them for a time to apparently prosper, to reveal the weakness and folly of the natural heart. But the Lord will in his own time and in his own way bring down the pride and folly of these deceived ones. and show to them their true condition. If they will accept the humiliation and by confession and sincere repentance turn unto the Lord, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, he will renew his love to them. But if they shut their eyes to their own sins, as did the Jews, and choose their own ways, the Lord will give them up to blindness of mind and hardness of heart and they cannot discern the things of the Spirit of God. Now if you follow these words very carefully in principle, you will see that that's exactly where Nebuchadnezzar was. He was being honoured because he, he, God used him and when he gave him the vision, God gave him a vision. He was honored and his natural heart began to swell within him. Wow, you know, God is really great and he's honoring me. And you'll see me as we, as we will be reading statements how this fact that God said, you are that head of gold, made his head swell. And he was a very good king, but he was full of self. And that's what it said here. They trust in their own wisdom and the Lord permits them for a time, to apparently prosper. But all for a purpose. He uses that to do what? To show them their condition of sin 
And although he lets them get along well for a while and then he puts them in a, in a situation by which he wants them to come to humiliation and by confession and sincere repentance turn to the Lord and perfect holiness. And this is precisely the story that we're going to be following in Nebuchadnezzar because that's exactly where God had him. So that now, after he had used Nebuchadnezzar as an instrument to punish Judah, he now used Nebuchadnezzar to discover himself. Very beautiful story. And this is our consideration at this camp. So the natural heart can be honourable and do honourable things. And God will use that to swing that person around. And we want to get to know God as we behold him working with Nebuchadnezzar. So when Nebuchadnezzar's good-hearted nature was met with treachery, we had read that he became very violent and cruel. And we will read it again in Prophets and Kings, page 450, paragraph 4. That is Prophets and Kings, page 450, and there in paragraph 4. Foremost among those who were rapidly leading the nation to ruin was Zedekiah, their king. Forsaking utterly the counsels of the Lord as given through the prophets, forgetting the debt of gratitude he owed Nebuchadnezzar, violating his solemn oath of allegiance taken in the name of the Lord God of Israel, Judah's king rebelled against the prophets, against his benefactor and against his God. In the vanity of his own wisdom, he turned for help to the ancient enemy of Israel's prosperity, sending his ambassadors into Egypt that they might give him horses and much people. And we remember the story. It completely proved his ruin. The cruelty in the heart of Nebuchadnezzar was fully unleashed. The goodness in his heart was replaced by cruel retribution. And I've repeated that picture again just to help us appreciate this is the natural heart. And as we read it here in Proverbs 14.35, it is again uh, made very vivid to our understanding. Proverbs 14, reading there, Verse 35. The king's favor is toward a wise servant. That's what a vassal is, a servant to someone higher than him. But his wrath is against him that causeth shame. You put a natural heart inside of a king and the king will do both sides of his heart. Kindness, courtesy, magnanimity, and extreme cruelty if it is not honoured. This is the product of the natural heart. And Nebuchadnezzar displayed it really well. And by studying him, we can have played out before us the bipolar condition of every heart. He's got it, and so have you and I. The, the detail of this bipolar condition of the natural heart and then the in ingredient of God coming in and strengthening or seeking to strengthen the good side is detailed in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. 
Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 and 20. I should be reading 17 as well. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you are led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. Now these were all characteristic of Nebuchadnezzar. He was an idolater. He also practiced witchcraft and hatred, variance. Emulations, well, wanting to be better than the others. Wrath, oh, wasn't he wrath? Strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. So, can you see here the flesh with its proud thoughts that it is so good? With its proud thoughts that, look, God is even honoring me here. And then those cruel traits which amount to all those descriptions there. Fornication, uncleanness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, etc. While God picks up human beings and orchestrates their behavior to rub off on the history of the planet to orchestrate events at the same time he is trying to save remember what we were reading there about the hand between the angels wings that was conducting the wheels within wheels the complications of human nature he would control it and govern it all and in our study of this in Nebuchadnezzar's position as the king of Babylon, as the first great world empire that continued thereafter with the other world empires, God was orchestrating it all. Every player, in, every actor in the field was practicing his natural attributes which God orchestrated to bring about the final conclusion now in these last days. But as he's doing it, simultaneously he's operating for conversion. This is an amazing study. This is an amazing discovery of God's mind. And we want, to, and remember, we were reading this in our previous studies that when we meet each other, when we meet human beings and we see their natural heart, and we shake our head and think, how can they do this? Well, don't forget, we've got exactly the same problem in our own heart. And we can be kind and courteous when we discover that God is at work here and we want to bear one another in love, no matter what we see faulty in each other, because God is at work. And we are not a people who have turned ourselves against God. We have wanted to follow him. And, we've, and we observe in Nebuchadnezzar's example that he also was beginning to worship God. But, he, but God wasn't finished with him until it came through to the very end. So this will be our focus now. We've seen Nebuchadnezzar with his bipolar condition and we see him all the way through the next few studies that we will be going through to actually see how he responds in response to God, worshipping him, acknowledging him, and being convicted by him, and then turning back from him again, and then swinging back again, 
and back and forth and back and forth until he goes insane. And there we have an object lesson because we will also go insane unless we do what Nebuchadnezzar finally did. So our studies will continue to the ultimate end, insane, hopeful insanity or hopeless insanity. The Lord will teach us through Nebuchadnezzar. So tonight we have a picture that the battle between the Spirit of God that is working on our hearts and the flesh is for us to tune our minds for the future studies to actually see this happening in the, in the life of Nebuchadnezzar and learn the precious lessons from it. God grant us the ability to take it in, is my prayer. Amen.